Thanks for joining the Deer Labs at Mississippi State University and the University of Florida as we enjoy our takeoff on March Madness. Our championship bracket includes 32 forages that together provide excellent nutritional support to a deer population. If you're able to provide these forages across your property in adequate amounts, you're doing a good job preparing the habitat for your deer. Today is the last of four regional championship shows, leading to the final showdown with the best from each forage category. Today's show covers forbs. Now, forbs are sensitive to variation in rainfall, especially in drier regions, but these, these plants are extremely important from a nutritional standpoint. If you've listened to some of our podcasts, you've heard how valuable forbs are to provide the high quality diet needed to support optimum fawn recruitment in females and antler and body growth in males. So today's guest host is a leader in guiding deer policy and management at the national level. Kip Adams is the chief conservation officer of the National Deer Association. Kip, thanks for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Steve. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's It's been a great, this has been really a lot of fun getting uh, folks uh, involved with, with our kind of brainchild here, if, if you would. Uh, you know, me personally, my bracket is in pretty bad shape. And uh, we hope that the folks listening haven't had their brackets crushed in our earlier regional rounds. The reality is each regional bracket contains some really top rated forages. So this is a battle of the best against the best. Here today to break down the four bracket are Marcus Lashley and Bronson Strickland. Appreciate that, Steve. I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, it's really tough to choose between these forages, especially you know, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum and, and other arenas. We have a podcast episode on it even. You know, what deer are choosing when and why may vary even at the individual level. So we have all these good forages, which are really commonly eaten, but the context uh, behind the animal's choice, it can be really important. And, uh, you know, you might see one of these elite ranked top in different, you know, in different properties, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, which I hear people sort of uh, have banter about between each other, who, who's, who's got the best forage or which one's best on their property. So I think that we're, we're kind of seeing that play out here. It's really challenging. We have, you know, our favorites out of these lists, but, uh, you know, it, it's really about making sure that the animals have a choice between all these great things so they can choose the best one at a given time for them. So uh, let's go ahead and get into the species profiles. We're in the Forbes bracket now, and uh, the first one we want to cover is sunflower. So this is in the genus Helianthus, and you probably have a species of this close to you. It may not be narrow leaf. That's the one that we had widely available. But I'll tell you, in mo most properties that I see this widely available, it is getting hammered by deer. It's browsed heavily. It typically you know, sort of middle of the road on a lot of the nutritional metrics. When we think about forbs, you know, it, we commonly will think about, oh, man, that thing is through the roof on crude protein. Well, this one isn't, but we still see it readily used by deer. And uh, this is just a native version of the sunflowers that are domesticated, you know, that we might plant in a, a food plot. And I hear it all the time. People have a lot of trouble getting their sunflowers to seed because deer hammer them early in their growth. So uh, I think that this, this is definitely a formidable opponent, even though the nutritional values tend to be a little bit lower on this one. Yeah, that, that's good to point out, Marcus. I'm glad you made that, that distinction. We put so much weight on crude protein, and there's good, good reason for it. Obviously, crude protein is really important. Um, but this is a good example of a plant we commonly see on the landscape, this browse, uh, at times very heavily. But when you go back and check the crude protein, you might understand, not understand why exactly that is. So uh, I think it's a really good choice. You might look at the diagnostics and say, hey, it's not going to be that highly selected. But from anyone in the field seeing this, you understand that, yeah, this can be a really important forage for deer. 
Yeah, you know what, guys? I'll add. Uh, I'm a long way from Starkville uh, here in northern Pennsylvania, but you know this is something that's used, you know, in a lot bigger areas than just the southeast. And uh, I'll tell you that uh, I agree with you from uh, the, the attractiveness of this. And uh, from a personal note, uh, I'll say there's a lot of things that I choose to eat that might not have the highest protein content that just tastes <laughs> really, really good to me. And uh, I think this is one of those uh, that just tastes really good to deer because uh, it is certainly uh, a deer favorite. Great. Let's look at the next one. All right, pokeweed. I actually have tried this one. It, if you, I, I remember uh, in back when I was young, uh, my grandparents had collected some of it. And if you boil it a few times over again and change the water out, it actually, uh, you can make poke salad out of it. So uh, really interesting. But this is one of those forages where the crude protein is very high and mo most people recognize that it's an excellent forage because of that. They probably don't think about the fact that it is so widely eaten by so many species of birds, for instance. I mean, this is one of those plants that's kind of a staple in my mind from a wildlife standpoint. So uh, really important. Yeah, without a doubt. One thing you said, Marcus, that I think is really important too, how charismatic this plant is. This, this is one that most people are going to recognize. I mean, literally, you, you can identify it from the berries. And then if you're a hunter, you have noticed that deer are going to browse this. Now, and here's one of those cases where uh, the crude protein is through the roof. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a native plant here that has crude protein as high as any of our food plot forages. So yeah. um, based on experience, seeing how often this is browsed, and then you look at the diagnostics of crude protein and things like that, this one is gonna be a contender in my mind. And, and you know, when uh, I talk to people often that, that have uh, you know cattle on their, their land, and those people, this is really common in the pastures, you'll see it invading around uh, some of the different things you know, where the soil is being disturbed when you have a cattle operation. And typically those landowners hate this plant. That's, that's what I get from it. it. You know, it's it's toxic to cattle. It's toxic to us if you don't boil it several times. It has a secondary plant compound in it that is an herb, anti-herbivore defense. And that sort of has lingered on into, uh, you know, the, the agricultural realm. But uh, yeah, I think this is one of those plants for me that is just so widely important for wildlife that, that it certainly should be thought of as a contender. I agree. This is one of my favorites that I don't think that you can do much better than this for deer. Um, you know, it just really shines for folks who, who plant a lot of food plots or in that, you know, real dry years. You know, I've seen a lot of places with total food plot failure that was just flush with, with pokeweed around the edges of those. And, uh, you know, and the landowners have asked me, geez, should I mow this down and try again? And I say, you know, only if you're an idiot, you know, no, you know, <laughs> this is, this is highly preferred. And as you can see, you know, this grows, you know, it's a really tough plant. So, uh, it grows in, in even some harsh environments. So, uh, and this is a uh, really wide ranging. So uh, it's no wonder, mm -hmm. you know, deer throughout their range, uh, are big fans of pokeweed. Yep, for sure. All right, let's look at the next one. Common ragweed. This is probably the one that I hear people throw around the most when they're thinking about a high quality forb that you're trying to encourage with practices like timber harvest and prescribed fire. Uh, you know, if you're managing an old field that people automatically are drawn to this species. And I think it's for good reason. It has a, a really important place for many wildlife species in plant communities. It, just like these other forbs, you know, when we're managing for habitat, we're trying to encourage a collection of these species, right? And this is certainly one of those that, that is a staple. The crude protein on this one, just like pokeweed, I, I've seen it get up around 30 uh, in the particular site that we collected these data on. It was a little bit lower, but it is certainly up in the elite class of uh, pokeweed I've seen up in the upper thirties even, but uh, this one commonly will get around 30%. So it can be really important for that. Another cool thing about this plant is based on its life history strategy, it needs that soil disturbance to really thrive. And it, the uh, some of the studies on the seeds for this, it will actually sit in the seed bank 
for decades and uh, potentially even hundreds of years. We actually have seeds from 1850s, I believe, that still germinate that were kept uh, in soil. So it's kind of cool that that plant has that strategy that it you know, just sits there and waits on you to release sunlight to the ground and disturb the soil or, or uh, use it for scrap fire and it, it can thrive in that situation. So really cool, definitely a contender for me. It typically is, is uh, you know, very high, especially phosphorus uh, it tends to be very high, even in comparison to some of our food plots. Well, Marcus, unlike deer that run to ragweed, I'm one of these allergy sufferers. I run away <laughs> from it. Um, but I think you brought up a really good point in that oftentimes when we're talking about some of these native forages, we'll get some feedback on how do I go plant that? And w what you just mentioned is you don't, you don't have to worry about planting this forage. It's there. It's in the seed bank. Just disturb the soil and, and it's going to be there. In yeah. fact, sometimes when I'm at a at a disturbed site, I'll even think, I wonder why deer aren't selecting this forage as much as I thought they would. And it's simply because there's so much of it. It's like once that disturbance happens, there's so much ragweed. You may go to a particular plant or group of plants and they haven't been selected by deer, but, but give it time mm -hmm. and they will. So again, yeah. an, another solid choice uh, here with common ragweed. Yeah, no allergies for me with this. Um, I love to see this. And I'll say I've, I've seen some uh, food uh, habit studies with deer where this is only moderately preferred. Um, but I'll say from my experience, you know, if there's a lack of high quality forage, th this is absolutely hammered. And, and even in a lot of areas where that are doing a really good job managing their, their vegetation where you have good stuff, this is used pretty heavily in those as well. So, uh, um, yeah, deer certainly aren't don't have allergic reactions to this. this. People like this too. They can everybody can identify this one. So if you're starting to get managed habitat, this is an easy one to see germinate and come up. And uh, you know, folks like that. They know what it is. They identify. They see a browse. So uh, if as long as you're not allergic to it, this is this is often a fan favorite. Yeah. Let's look at the next one. All right, beggar slice. So uh, if you've walked around in a really well managed place for your deer forage, you've probably gotten these little triangular seeds stuck all over you. And uh, if that's the case, you're probably doing a pretty good job. And that's because you have a suite of these Desmodium species. So uh, yeah, that basically that velvety leaf and, and seed is an important mechanism for the plant to disperse itself. And that's what you're, why you're seeing that. And a lot of people hate it because of that, because if you walk around, you walk your dog, you get out in there and you have these things stuck all over you and then, you know, they're stuck all in your socks or whatever. Uh, but make no mistake, this is one of those forbs that I want anywhere that I'm managing for early succession or I'm trying to have a developed understory to manage for wildlife. I want this to be a staple plant in it because it's just so well-rounded for so many species and uh, it maintains a really nutritious uh, composition throughout the season. Some of the other metrics are really high for this one. It, it tends to be sort of middle of the road on crude protein and even a little bit low on phosphorus. But uh, in the other metrics, it often does pretty well. So really great plant all around. Yeah, th this is one of, of those plants, you know, Marcus, you, you've described it perfectly. When, when I was young in the single digits and running around with a 410 or a 22, uh, I, I remember getting this, you know, this beggar's lice. We didn't call it Desmodium. Beggar's lice getting all over my pants and uh, my mom having a conversation with me about, you know, when you get that stuff all over you, you got to take the time and pick it off. So it doesn't get in the clothes and, you know, get in the washer and dryer and all that stuff. So I remember this plant way back. And um, this is, again, here, here's a great example too. I'll contrast with pokeweed. When I see this plant, I see it browse. It seems like if there's deer on the landscape, you're going to see this browse. And the crude protein isn't as high, but there's something like Kip mentioned, it must just taste really good to deer because we see it selected all the time. Hey, Kip, uh, for, you to, for our listeners to really fully understand why Marcus likes this plant so much, it's because you have to be burning 
pretty regularly to get it. So anything that he has to burn, to, <laughs> he's going to like it. I gotcha. I gotcha. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, I'll be short on this one. There's a lot of things that, uh, you know, if it, if it looks good to people, it doesn't often look good to deer, you know, the open park like atmosphere. And conversely, a lot of things that a person looks at and says, Oh, it just looks thick or nasty. Um, which means, you know, it's a 180 for deer. Deer are loving it. And, uh, and that's certainly the case uh, with places that are growing beggars lice. Sure. So the eupatoriums are another one that this is an important component. Again, uh, you know, these forbs are really common in areas that we are getting plenty of sunlight in. We've, we've talked about that on each of these. Now, if you're getting enough sunlight in and you have a recurring disturbance like prescribed fire or you're, you're uh, disturbing the soil with, with the disc behind the tractor, doesn't matter. You're often uh, encouraging a suite of these forb species. This one, I typically don't think of as that important deer forage, but it is very important for several other things. However, I do pretty commonly see this browsed in that suite of species when we're giving deer a diversity of choices. They certainly are utilizing this plant when it's available. Yeah, Marcus, uh, my familiarity with it is, I guess, kind of like ragweed. It seems like uh, following disturbance, you're not just going to see a handful of these plants. You're going to see hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I assume it is relative to deer density. There will be times when uh, every plant you see has been browsed to some extent. And there might be other times where it's not. And that just might be, um, again, relative to the other options in terms of plants that deer have available to them. Uh, but certainly a very important plant that we see deer consume readily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my perspective, when you guys gave me the list of, of uh, species here, um, I thought either A, you guys were messing with me, and uh, or B, this is the Cinderella story if, if this wins. Uh, I, I like bone set to see, you know, in uh, in a field because, you know, from the structure perspective and, you know, and hey, I do most of my work for deer, but I like to see the value for other wildlife species as well. So I look at this as one of those species that, that's feeding more of other things than deer, but uh, the structure is definitely good. I've seen lots of cases where fawns were laying under under tall plants of this. So, uh, but, uh, so I don't think this is going to win the food part of it, but, uh, but I guess you never know. So uh, deer yeah. can, uh, can come up with some crazy things that they like once in a while. But I think it, it makes a lot of sense to you know pick things that are really great plants like this, but maybe the Cinderella story or underdog, mm -hmm. so to speak. I, I like an underdog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's look at the next one. Lettuce. I, I was kind of surprised when we started seeing people fill out their brackets online that this one's getting ranked top pretty commonly. Uh, I typically, I, I love lettuce. So this lactuca is the genus that you grow, you know, that you might grow in your garden, different kinds of lettuce. Those are in lactuca as well. Uh, really commonly, you'll, you'll see it in the pictures we have that uh, if you break a leaf off, it has that white milky sap again, an anti-herbivory compound. Uh, the, what we collected and the reason, you know, that, uh, we like this forage is during the time of the year, during the late spring, right before it's gone to, to uh, flower, it has this nice little bushy basil rosette of really tender succulent leaves. The same kinds of leaves that you'd be collecting off of your lettuce that you're growing in your garden, in fact. And I certainly see deer collect those leaves off of the basil rosettes when they're available in the wild. And at that time of year in particular, I think they're pretty important. So uh, this one, Again, it's sort of middle of the road for Forbes on some of these nutritional metrics, but I have seen it sometimes be much higher, especially in protein. And there's no question that uh, that it's a you know a, a preferred plant when it's available, at least from my perspective. I really struggled with this one, Marcus. Uh, I, I tend to be the you know the quantitative kind and I tend to put a lot of weight into the diagnostics and you could uh, get some samples when the plant's really young and approach 20 percent crude protein but rarely are you going to exceed that and then you compare it with something like pokeweed that might be approaching 30 or exceed 30 percent but but then you got to go with what what you see in the field and almost always when you see this plant uh, a deer has found it first and, and it's been browsed heavily. So 
I struggled with my pick. You know, this, this was right up there. Really, really important forage. Yeah, I agree, uh, Bronson. I tell you, I'm, I'm blessed to work in 20 to 25 different states each year uh, across the Whitetails range. And uh, every time I see this north, south, uh, Midwest, anywhere I am, I see this hit hard. Uh, I, I took this one deep into the tournament. So uh, I, I understand this doesn't have the, the protein content that some of the others do, but uh, but I always see this hit. And, uh, and I love to see this in areas that I manage. So uh, I think this one's going deep. I, I didn't end up taking this as my winner, but uh, I had them in there for a long time. That's good. <laughs> Let's look at this next one. Spanish needles. This is another one that is sort of a, uh, one of those plants that gets a bad rap, I think. And for good reason, if you've ever walked around in waders in a wetland that has uh, a biden species in it, it'll cause you fits because it gets all in your waders and stick. And for, from these seeds that it, that it has, where they have these barbs on it, you can see in this picture here, they'll actually attach to your clothes and, and cause all kinds of problems poking you through it. And I think people generally don't like it because of that. But uh, no question, this is one of those species that's really important. And uh, one thing I wanted to, to point out is it has a really showy flower. And there are a couple of other species, like goldenrod is one that comes to mind that have a showy flower. And they're all flowering at the same time as, as uh, ragweed, which does not have a very showy flower. So they often get a bad rap for causing allergies when actually the culprit is that mm -hmm. ragweed. Most of your allergies are actually being caused from that plant. And, the, you know, this was one that, that uh, I hear people say that they're allergic to. And it's probably just because it's flowering at the same time. No question, though, this one tends to be on the upper end of nutritional quality, especially for some of those, those other things other than protein that deer might need. And uh, I see it pretty commonly. Again, it's almost always in a suite of Forbes species, but I see this one being rarely used in most of those contexts. I'm probably biased. I, I had to think about, uh, and is my personal experience gonna, gonna bias me and make a bad choice here? But the, the places I hunt, I see this browse heavily. And it, it, it was a plant that until probably 10 years ago, I wasn't that familiar with. And, and so Marcus and Steve, like we talked about on the podcast, it, it may be a situational thing, it may be based on a context regarding the, the plant community around it. But um, in, in the environment I'm in anyway, I, I see it selected a lot, but it, it doesn't seem like it gets a lot of favor from other people. So it, it may be something that's really important in different locations based on disturbance, based on plant community. Uh, so I think it's an important forage, but I, I don't know if it's going to be my pick. Yeah, this is kind of a sneaky one. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't think that this one is as recognizable as some of the others we've talked to for for people that actually manage habitat and, and work the land a little bit. Um, and then, you know, you hear the name the Spanish needles. It just doesn't have nearly as an attractive name as, as some of the others. Uh, um, deer definitely like this. I see this hit a bunch. I don't see this... Um, I guess as, as widely in my travels as some of the other stuff. And, and I think that this is definitely one that's just not as, as common or as recognizable to a lot of folks who, who do manage habitat. So uh, we may be, there may be a lot of people surprised on, on how this one shakes out at the end. Yeah. Maybe they don't recognize it because they haven't walked through a whole bunch of it. <laughs> but when, uh, when you walk through, it's pretty recognizable then <laughs> all those things sticking all over you. So, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here with Lespedeza. <clears throat> and this is another one of those plants that's in the suite of forbs that we're tr commonly trying to encourage when we're managing for deer habitat. And I think it's widely recognized as a really high value wildlife plant. But another one that I kind of feel like may be a sleeper when we think about it from a browse preference standpoint, it I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One, it's kind of difficult to see deer brows on it. The other thing, like several of these other plants, when we have a really intact forb community, it's so widely available that, you know, com the combination of it being hard to see the brows on it and it being so available in the community, we may not give it as much credit as it needs, but it typically is pretty high in most of the nutritional metrics and commonly see it show up in, in the deer diet when we actually, uh, you know, 
uh, run some of these diet trials and look at what deer have been eating out in the wild. Definitely commonly shows up. And I think for that reason, uh, it's probably a, a pretty good contender here and maybe not the favorite for a lot of people because of some of those reasons. Well, I fall in that category, Marcus. Um, I think it's certainly worthwhile. I think it's a contender and I'm biased again on my personal experience. It's one of those plants to me, it looks like it ought to be highly selected. I mean, it just looks like a fantastic forward for deer, but then I'm, I'm commonly in places where I don't see it selected as much as some of the others. And, and, and again, I'm uh, just saying it, it may be based on how diverse the plant community is and so forth. Um, but to me, I would probably put it in a moderate selection category. Now, our deer may prove us wrong. They commonly do. Deer do what deer do. And we don't understand it sometimes. But uh, I kind of think of it as more of moderate selection, uh, a contender. But I don't think it's going to be my pick. Yeah, this is kind of a, maybe a little bit like the last one. You know, I think there's a lot of folks who... You know, there's a lot of different Lespedeses out there. And, of course, Sarisha gets such a bad rap for good reason. Um, there's a lot of folks that if they aren't real up on all of the different species, you know, just kind of bunch them all together. And Lespedes, oh, that's bad. I want to be rid of that. Uh, this is certainly a good one for deer. Um, I don't tend to think of this as, as competing with uh, wild lettuce or, or pokeweed or, or even ragweed, though. So uh, I'm guessing, that actually, I'm, I'm going to put this into the lower half of the bracket for those that are there. Um, I like to see it. I think it's a real valuable, but uh, I don't think it's one of the superstars. Well, guys, you, you've really brought out a lot of interesting uh, anecdotal perspectives here, and it really helps our listeners understand that when it comes to a plant, there is no such thing as the silver bullet in deer management. We don't want a particular dominant plant across the landscape. It's all about diversity, and we provide enough variation in habitat, the deer will be able to select it and they'll have these little nuances that they're looking for against sulfur, uh, positive for, sometimes positive for sulfur if sulfur is limited on the, on the, uh, the landscape. So it's hard to predict, and, but we have to predict. We've got eight great forages here that could all be winners. And guys, what, what do you say? Let's, let's, the deer are going to pick their winner in just a few minutes, but let's hear what the experts have to pick. Bronson, you want to lead us off? Not really, but, uh, <laughs> but I will. I guess I'll jump out there. I chose uh, Desmodium, and uh, let me make sure that is what I <laughs> There we go, yeah. yeah. Can't I remember. Chose, yeah, I thought that's who I picked. Yeah, Beggar's Lice, and, and, and again, the, the diagnostics aren't as good as some of the others, and uh, but just based on experience, it's what, whenever I see this plant, I, I see it selected. And uh, like Kip mentioned, it just must taste really, really good to a deer, even though the crude protein isn't as high as pokeweed or something like that. So I, I base it on that. I base it on what I see in the woods. So I, I chose beggar's lice. Marcus? It's a good pick. So, Bronson, uh, I, I'm finally appreciating your your uh, choice of forages here. Uh, for me, I had to go with my, my favorite genus, and I also selected Desmodium, in this case, the beggar's lice. And I think I may have done it for a little different reason than you did, but... <laughs> Desmodium, it, it's been my favorite genus for a while. And I, I worked on this, uh, let's see, up in the in eastern Tennessee on my master's work. I think that's when I first started developing an appreciation for it. <clears throat> I, was, I was measuring deer forage availability and diet selection and all those things. And we had the, the worst drought on record during that year. And this was the plant that very clearly was still taking browse heavily and it was still producing during that drought and I've got nutritional quality on it and it still maimed a 16 or higher percent crude protein. It was one of the only forages that took that drought and did that. And it was one of the only forages that they were getting hammered, uh, you know, consistently and taking that. 
the other thing about this plant that I find really interesting, and I think it may be the only one out of all of them that does this to such a degree, is its entire life history strategy is to get mammals close to it. And here's just an example for you. This is my dog. When, you know, This may actually be a good way to measure habitat quality. Just if you have a dog, take your dog and walk it through your, your little patch of habitat. And if it looks like that, when you get done, it's probably a pretty good spot for a deer and, and a whole suite of other species. And for me, the actual, you know, the idea that this plant has developed all these mechanisms to withstand heavy browse, even during extreme things like, like the uh, drought that I was talking about, and it needs mammals to get close to it I mean, deer are mammals I, I feel like they're going to want to get close to it and just to go a little bit further than that I, if you don't have a dog and uh, you want to measure habitat quality you can just uh, walk through your habitat and you can see <laughs> exactly what happens right here I walked through some high quality deer habitat on the way uh, to work this morning so for me this is one of those plants that that uh it, it just has to be at the top or near the top. So I have to pick Becker's Lice. Kip, what do you think? Well, man, I guess I missed the production meeting where uh, we got to, to <laughs> have some additional. Uh, so anybody watching this, it's clear that we didn't get together beforehand and talk about, you know, uh, sports fans. Sometimes it's like, Bronson, you have to say something good about this guy. Marcus, you say something bad. That's cool. This is all honest and straight off the cuff here. Um, mm -hmm. With this, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing uh, how much deer like beggars lice at all. I'm, I think that is a great one as well. For me, though, I went with pokeweed. And, uh, and that's just because it doesn't matter where I go. Um, and maybe it's just because this plant is very identifiable and, you know, it's, it's easy to see. It really sticks out. But, uh, you know, this is I love to see this on anybody whose land that I'm helping manage habitat. I really love to see it everywhere on my land where it's growing. Um, you know, deer and a whole host of other wildlife species will, will eat on this. And uh, so uh, I, I have I don't know that I've ever seen one that didn't get browsed. Uh, and get browsed heavily during uh, the course of the summer or fall. So uh, for those reasons, uh, I think there was a lot of really strong contenders in this, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my, with my pick of pokeweed. Good deal, Kip. That, that is a great choice because pokeweed is, I think it's the highest value of protein, phosphorus, and the greatest suggestibility of our eight, our eight options. So uh, it's almost like unbelievably high values. Like, why would a deer not want to be eating a lot of that pokeweed? So I understand where you're coming from, Kip. I'm, I'm not going to go with pokeweed because I've seen some uh, issues with the timing of attraction. And early in its life's development, within a year, uh, the deer don't seem to be hitting it as hard. And at some point, there's some biochemical changes in the plant uh, that uh, makes it more attractive. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, pass up the that option of going like I like like I did in an earlier episode where I, I went with the highest uh, protein and phosphorus values and digestibility I'm gonna I'm gonna step back from that the desmodiums uh beggars lice and the lespedeza I, I love these plants also they're legumes they're in the bean family uh, my problem with these two guys is that I can't I couldn't choose between them which one do I choose? And and my indecision led me to just, well, all right, I'm just not going to take either one. I couldn't choose between them. And my, my actual choice comes down to anecdotal observations from our, our enclosures, our exclosure study that we uh, conducted a number of years ago here at the Mississippi State Deer Lab, where we erected deer proof fencing on roughly eight acres in three different regions of the state and we had multiple exclosures set up in each region and where the the wild lettuce occurred it only occurred outside uh, inside the fence where the deer couldn't get it and so to me that that speaks volumes of uh the attractiveness of wild lettuce it's it's not one of these plants that just looks great i mean looking at it especially in that stock stage it, it just doesn't look like a something a deer would want. The stalk is pretty thick. It's not a lot of leaves on it. But man, uh, if you if you go where there's deer, 
that stalk is going to be about three feet tall. If you go where there's no deer in, inside of our exclosures, that stalk was 12, 15 feet tall. So deer like this, and I'm going to, I'm going to choose it as my forb today. Marcus and Kip, if you didn't see that, Steve pulled a not so fast. <laughs> not so fast gentlemen yeah. Yeah. But, well you know, one of the one of the problem potential problems now i've chosen it but one of the potential problems with wild lettuce is it's not widely distributed uh, it doesn't occur in all habitats and and where it does it you know it tends to be in wetter wetter habitats so yeah you know, i don't know if, if our deer and the deer pens are familiar with it enough to to choose it but that's what no, I'm going. They're not. They're not swamp bucks, Steve. Is that <laughs> what you're saying? <laughs> well, that that's why we play the game, right? We have our yeah. predictions, and we're going to play the game and see what the deer select. That's right. Very so good. let's let's jump in here now and look at some of the highlights from today's head-to-head -head matchup. These eight Forbes being selected for by our bucks at the Mississippi State University Deer Research Facility. Now, I'll remind our viewers that we had two sets of eight so that the deer could all three of the bucks that were particularly tame enough to be involved in this they could all have however much of whatever they wanted there was no limitation of forage no competition for a limited resource we weighed it before we weighed it after and let the deer tell us look at that i think i know what's in that container oh desmodium <laughs> <laughs> that lighter colored leaf. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah. Oh, like could oh, and they were the randomly look. They he were just randomly close. The so uh, <laughs> the same corner isn't necessarily the same forage between the two groups. Look at this guy. He's shopping. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. sniffing, sampling. Yeah. Oh, what's that on his lip? Oh, it was Desmodium stuck to it. <laughs> oh, he stepped in. He stepped <laughs> in one stepping of the on the pokeweed. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did he not eat it, he's just like, get that stuff out of here. Uh, that was a little dis uh, disrespectful, then. He didn't eat anything. <laughs> he said, look at the desmodium all over my lips. <laughs> I think he was full from the pokeweed that was growing around the edge of the, of the uh, exposure. He was all full, so he couldn't have anything else uh, for dessert. Yeah. That's a, that's a good – we can come up with lots of reasons why we didn't win. Because, obviously, we've got three choices – from our experts, at least, well, only, well, there's going to be at <laughs> least two of us disappointed today, and maybe three when when they choose wild lettuce. <laughs> could, could be all of us. Just saying. Could good be point. All of us. <laughs> it won't be the first time I've been disappointed by deer. Hmm. Well, let's look at that bracket. Who made it out of this category? Uh, uh, any plant whose entire life ha history strategy is to get mammals close to it. There it is, right there. Y'all, excuse me. I'm going to mm -hmm. take a victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> Bronson, did you see my picks beforehand? Is that what? No, no. What happened here? Oh no. no. Uh -uh. <laughs> I, I was confident I'd be the only one to pick that one. I think uh, Marcus took a pre-victory lap, given uh, what's on his shirt there. So, uh, Brad, I guess, Bronson, you better do the same and come back so we can see it yeah. uh, on your shirt as well. I, I ran around in the deer habitat before I came in here, and uh, it you told me what to pick. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Very great. interesting. Very interesting. All those good forages. I was really, uh, as I kind of alluded to, I was, it, wild lettuce, pokeweed, and beggar's lice. Those are the three I was really struggling with. Yeah, I, I, I was with those and wild lettuce, really, uh, putting that one in. Th those were my top, the top four in the bracket for me. I, I think there's something that's important to think about for people is, you know, deer diet selection is not just driven by how much crude protein is in a plant, even though that's what we often use as our metric of quality. Uh, they, they need all sorts of other nutrients and, and uh, they even use plant secondary compounds. Like, you know, we saw some of these, pokeweed has one in it. Uh, 
the uh, wild lettuce has one in it with the black tuca. They, you know, a lot of these species have compounds in them that deer might need to give them digestive feedbacks or, or carry out something physiologically that we really just don't even understand. And it might result in some of these changes that we see in diet selection based on context. It's not all driven by availability or protein. So. Well, well, Kip, I'm, I'm sorry you lost, but, but thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to have some fun with us and talk about the ecology and management of these different plants. So Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that you are awesome. welcome. And uh, Bronson, we've been friends a long time. You don't have to lie to me and tell me you're sorry I lost, particularly <laughs> given that you won. So, uh, but no, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. This is a really cool thing that you guys did there. I appreciate the uh, uh, the opportunity to be involved with this and have some fun with you guys. And I'm looking forward now to seeing the overall winner. So, uh, congratulations, Bronson. Congratulations, Marcus. And uh, oh, uh, I got my eye on uh, who's going to come out on top all at the end. So, uh, pretty cool idea. That's right. We, we've, we've won a few, lost a few along the way here. The deer have chosen their final four, <clears throat> their final four forages. Join us on our next show as we learn which one takes the forage championship. <laughs>